Hello everybody and welcome to this new video series about creating a complete and powerful application using the Find Toolkit. Here we're going to highlight many points of development, covering tips, tricks and best practices that might come in handy for you when you're creating your own project. These live coding videos are going to be published each Thursday and that's in the afternoon UK time. So watch this channel for further updates. Hopefully this video and the series to come is helpful for anybody looking to get stuck into a big project of their own. But with that, let's get started. I'm gonna jump into Visual Studio Code and we can create our own project from there. We just open a folder and I'm gonna create a new one in my coding directory and I'm going to be calling it Fission because that's the name of the app that I'm creating. We open this folder and we have not a lot to be getting going with. So let's start our Go project that we can then include Fine in. I'm going to open a new terminal and let's just open up this window to be a bit wider and go mod in it. And that's how we create the Go module that's necessary to in package up our project. And we need to give it a name. Now this could be a local name, um, but it could be helpful to use a URL as the name in case anybody ends up wanting to import some of the code. In our case, I'm going to call it fission.app. And that creates a new module for our project. And you can see we have a Go mod file that's been created. So we can open that and it shows our module name and the Go version number that it's using. Because this is going to be a fine project, we can also add fine to our dependencies. We can go get fine.io slash fine slash v2, because this is the v2 of the API, and then at latest, which will download the latest release, which it's discovered is version 2.4.0 which is absolutely correct. That was released last week and it's exciting to be using it in a new application. And before we get any further into exploring the application we're going to build, let's just check it's all working. We'll create a new file called main.go and this is going to be a package main, which is required for any executable Go code and our application is of course an executable, a binary that's going to be used to build the user interface. We create our main function, func main, and inside here we're going to build our fine app just to get things up and running, check it's all working. In the usual way, we say a is app.new. That creates an application in the variable called a. And the new window that we're going to be using it's a dot new window and we'll title it fission app and that title will appear in a title bar if there is a area on your window to display it. Now let's just save this file and we'll get some imports. You can see here it's picked the old version of the API so we just need to make sure that the v2 appears in the import path and that should resolve that issue. Save the file again and we need to put a little content in our window, set content. We'll just use the widget package to create a new label. New label, fission app. And then that window, we want to show the window and run the application. Saving the file again, the imports are unfortunately a little fiddly first time round. I've opened a bug against this actually because I don't know why it happens, um, but that should resolve the issue. It's saying it can't find this uh, import path for fine. We did include it in our project, but it hasn't necessarily downloaded all of the dependencies. So to tidy this up, we call go mod tidy. And that's just going to make sure that all of the files needed are downloaded locally. I already had them, so that took no time at all. And this is the very basics of our application. 
And on this terminal here, we could just go run and then the full stop to indicate to run this package. And that's going to do a compilation and display the application that we've created. Here you go, it says fission app inside a window with the same title. If this is the first fine app you've ever built, that step might have taken a little bit longer. Particularly if you're on Windows, it can take a little while. Just the first time, after that, it will be really speedy, just like it was there. Now, that was super easy for me. I did have a few things installed already. The Go compiler, of course, but we also needed a C compiler to handle some of the graphics that happens behind the scenes. You never need to worry about using C but you do need it installed. For macOS, that was easy. I just have Xcode. But if you don't have this set up already, you might want to go to uh, developer.fine.io. This website here will contain most of the useful information that you'll need when building a Fine app. And if you just tap on getting started introduction, or indeed go straight to the started URL, it's going to show you a per platform guide for how to get set up. So if it's not working first time for you, head there for potential tips and tricks uh, needed to get things up and running. But let's assume that's worked for you as it did for me. So the next step is to think about what application we're going to be building. Now I find it quite helpful to have something to work from in terms of a design. And we're very lucky here at Fine Labs that our excellent designer, Charlie, had come up with a mock-up of the application we're going to build. As you'll know, it is an app builder. And we have this screenshot of the design that we're going to be aiming for. And over the series of videos, we'll be creating all of this content. But for now, we're just going to be setting up the layout and the theme to get the project up and running. You can see it has a top bar here. It's like a toolbar, a left and right panel and a content area. Let's see if we can get all of that working in this first video. So let us start with putting a little bit more content in this window. Now we could inline it here. We could create a new function in the main file, but I find it really helpful to start moving things out into separate areas so that main focuses on the core parts of actually interacting with getting the application started. Command line parameters and things like that, which we'll look at in a future video, can be really helpful here. So let's create a new file called GUI.go, and that's going to handle our user interface. It needs to be in the same package, at least for now. I know it's possible to split into multiple packages and have APIs between them, but that can be just a little bit of overhead, especially this early stage and Go does have an approach of just start with simple and it can evolve over time. So that's what we're going to do. But I'm going to create a function here called make GUI that is going to build the content for our window. That will return a canvas object. That is the basic graphical primitive of all items in the Find Toolkit. So whether it is a line, a rectangle, an entry widget, or something that we might create as a custom widget in the future, it's always going to be a canvas object. So we can pass that around and not worry about the details. The content of our window is going to be a border layout, something that sticks around the borders of our window, as I showed before. So we can just do that, um, return container, not new border. And the border um, type has various parameters. Let's just fix this import again, and it should resolve. There we go. So now it is suggesting that we haven't passed in appropriate parameters. And this help text is not super helpful. But if we just follow that link, we just I just command clicked in, we can see the constructor for new border. And it takes top, bottom, left, right, and any additional objects as the parameters. All of these are canvas objects like we saw before. So the top will be a toolbar. Uh, the bottom, we don't have anything in the bottom, so we'll call it nil. And left and right, not going to use imaginative names there. And there will be a content as well. Of course, none of these things exist yet. 
so we'll need to create them. The toolbar along the top is pretty straightforward. It is just a toolbar widget. New toolbar. And let's just create an item in that toolbar. A new toolbar action. So a toolbar action is when you have an icon in a toolbar which does some action when you tap on it. So the icon, we're going to use the home icon from the built-in theme, the home icon there. And the action could be any function, um, but right now we're not going to do anything. So we just pass it an empty function and that's our toolbar defined. For the left, right and content, well, we don't really have anything to display yet, but it could be helpful if we just use a label perhaps to hold that space and show that everything is working correctly. So we'll do labels like we did before, widget.new label, left and right, as you might imagine, is going to say right. And the content, well, we could do the same again. New label content. Okay, so that is now looking like it will compile correctly, but we're not using it yet. So let's just go back to our main file here. And instead of this label that we created, we will pass in this user interface that we've created in the make GUI function. I'll save that file and it looks like everything should be good. So let's run this again. And there we have. We've got a toolbar along the top with just the home icon and left content right. It looks like they're in a row, but if we expand, we can see the right is right aligned, left is left aligned, and the content is filling that space, but our text is currently left aligned. We can just double check that is in fact correct by changing the alignment on the text there. Text align center. Oh, very helpful ID suggested what I could do. And if we do the same thing again, it just helps us to see that the content is actually filling the space available. There we go. If you are curious about what exactly is happening there and how the container is laying out, there is a debug command that's going to be really helpful. We can compile our same application, but with debug turned on. So we pass in tags, debug. And as long as you're using fine 2.4.0 or newer, then that's going to build a version of your application that shows exactly how the user interface is built. So instead of changing the alignment of our content, we could have just run it like this, and we would see that that label is taking up the content space completely, and there's nothing at the bottom because we don't have a bottom um, widget passed into the border container. So that's super helpful. The next thing I think that you would probably notice about our user interface that I showed the screenshot of is that it had a light theme. And I'm in dark mode. I'm a developer. There's a good chance I'm going to be using dark mode for my coding. Um, but the UI that we've designed is one that's opinionated. It's decided that it's going to be light all the time. And I can see why that's useful, because if we're editing a user interface, we want something, um, the user interface that it is um, built with, to be of a different theme than what is being created inside it so that we can always see the difference. So let's look at how a custom theme will help us to achieve that outcome. So we go back to our main code here, which is wiring the application together. And if you use the um, settings function on application, it gives us access to the different settings that the user might have chosen at the operating system level uh, or at their fine configuration. And this has a really helpful function, set theme. So we, as the application developer, can override the default built-in theme with one of our own. This is quite powerful for, for putting our brand onto the application or for overriding certain functionality, which is exactly what we're going to do just now. So we can say new vision theme. We'll just be creating a new theme for this one app and passing it into set theme. Of course, that doesn't exist yet. So we're going to code that up. As I did with the user interface, I think it's going to be super helpful to have another file for the theme. So a new Go file called theme.go. 
And this is in package main again. And what we're going to do is to create a new type that is the custom theme for this project. So we create a type called vision theme, and that is a struct. We could code this theme entirely from scratch. I'll show you what that would mean. But also it's possible to inherit from an existing one. And in this case, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, it helps us reduce the coding just a little bit, especially if we only want to change one or two things. So to do that, we say, okay, this is going to have a fine theme embedded in it that we will then be using to delegate calls that we're not really interested in implementing. And the last thing we need to do to wire this up is to create that function that was referenced already, which is new vision theme. And that is going to return our theme, uh, but that is a find.theme, just like any other custom theme would be. And by specifying that type, we know that we've implemented it correctly. And so here we return a new instance of vision theme. And that's that. Uh, if we go back to main, we can see that the code is quite happy, but it's not going to do anything. In fact, it could even crash because we said we're going to inherit from a theme, but we haven't actually specified the theme that we're going to inherit from. So to do that, I just pass in the default theme from the theme package in fine. And there it has the right import path at last. That's excellent. So what is a theme? I mean, as you might imagine, it is some code that tells the user interface how it's going to look. But we can go in and have a, a more detailed look through this tooltip or by doing command tap or control tap, depending on your system. It's actually just four methods. Well, that's interesting. So for each thing that we can customize, there is a method, the size, icon, font, and color of the user interface. Obviously, there's lots of each of those. And so that's what these parameters are about. The size name or the color name is how we ask for a specific color or size. And when it comes to color, we have a theme variant. And the theme variant is going to be specifying light or dark, as you can see in the little pop-up there. That's the thing that's most interesting to us right now. So really, we want to override this color method. So we can do that here. Let's just paste in what we've copied over. So that will be uh, on our theme. Vision theme, um, make a new method. These, of course, I just copied from a different package. So we need to give the right name space there. And the color that it's returning is part of the built-in library. So if I just save it, it should get the import. There we go, image color. So we have a name, which is the color name that's been asked for, and the variant, which is the light or dark. It might be in the future, high contrast or, or something like that. But what we want to do is always have a light color. We're not too fussed exactly what the color is at this early stage, at least. So what I can do is to delegate this to the theme that we have used as a fallback. And so I can say for our internal theme, call the color method, pass in the name, and in the variant, I'm going to say that I always want this to use the light theme. So in fact, we don't need that variant variable at all. And that is our custom theme that specifies we always want light. However, while we're here, I also want to make the text just a little bit smaller. This is going to be an app with a lot of information in it. Um, and so we don't want it to be just huge and make it difficult to juggle all of the components. So I'll go back to the theme definition. And size is how we can override the font size and other things. So I'll do the same thing again for our vision theme, which I can't spell despite being this far in. We will create the size method. Just align that better. The name is in the fine namespace. And in this case, 
we're not delegating and assuming always use a certain size name. That wouldn't really make sense. However, we're going to say if the name is text size, there we go, size name text, we want to return something smaller. I think the default was uh, 14. So we'll pick something a little smaller. Let's just go with 12, see how that looks. And in all other cases, we're quite happy for the standard built-in theme to handle the sizes. So we can do like we did before, return the theme built, um, the extended theme, sorry, the theme that we have extended, we can ask for the size of that name and just return that. So there we have our complete custom theme, at least as much customization as we want just now. We've passed it to set theme on the app settings. So we actually should be good to go. If we run that code, you can see, there we go. It is a light colored theme. The labels and the icon color have all adapted appropriately because we have just said, I don't really mind which component you're asking about, always make it look light. And this might be your default look if you were on a computer that had light mode turned off, on, sorry. And of course the border would be light. Uh, but in our case, the operating system says dark, but our content says light mode. And you can see the text is smaller as well. So we have achieved our custom theme and everything's looking pretty great. Excellent. Okay, congratulations. That is our user interface and theme set up, but there's a lot more that we can do with that today to make it feel closer to the layout and the application that we saw in the screenshot. The next thing I want to look at is that there was a, a logo in the middle here, part of our branding that just made it feel like it was an app belonging to the business. So let's look at how we would do that. The toolbar does stretch across the top because it is the top of the border container that we saw before, but it only has a button on the left. I would like to put the logo right in the middle, but if I just put it into that space, it's going to be slightly too far to the right. And also a toolbar doesn't typically have a logo right in the middle of it. Now I could make a custom widget or extend the toolbar or convince the toolbar to accept my logo into it. But actually, I think there's something easier we can do than that. If we go to our GUI file here, where we created the toolbar, we could make the top banner and we could do it in two layers so that the toolbar was underneath and the logo was on top. Let's have a look at that. So I'm gonna create a new function called make banner, I suppose. Again, it's going to return canvas object. And what we do to put two things on top of each other, but to take up the full space is to use the stack container. So like we returned new border here, we will return container dot new stack. Um, as you can see, new stack, it was introduced in 2.4 but it has actually been part of the code base from the beginning. It just used to be called Max. So you could say new Max if you were in an older version of Fine, but we changed the naming. Um, it just seems a little bit more intuitive. So we will add the toolbar and we will also add the logo. Okay. Now the toolbar was defined here. So let's just take that code and put it into our method. And then the logo, okay. So how are we going to put a logo in there? Well, we need to load an, an image, I suppose, yeah. Okay, so images, they're not really widgets, they're not interactive. They're part of the canvas package as opposed to being in the widget package that we've been using a lot of so far. So we can say canvas new image and we're going to use the resource as the source of our image. What's a resource? Okay, well, I mean, it could be a lot of different things. It could be something that came from a file, downloaded from the internet. Essentially, it's just capturing the bytes of a file in memory so that we don't need to be constantly reading it in from an external location. And that is our logo. So that's how we're creating the logo. But how do we get the resource? Well, there's various different ways. You could say um, load resource from path or from URL. There's nothing wrong with those if you know that a path is going to exist or if a URL 
contains the data that you want to capture. However, this is part of our user interface. And just like all Go applications, we want to be able to distribute as a single file. We don't want to assume a lot of images alongside the application. Uh, doing so would require, on some operating systems anyway, an installer package. But dragging the application into your computer so it runs is way more effective. So instead, we're going to bundle the asset so it can always be referenced from just the binary. Again, there's lots of ways to do this. Go has introduced embed, which is a great way to do it. Um, but also, the find package uh, has its own way, which predates embed, uh, is a little bit more efficient. So I'm just going to show that anyway. I'm going to make a folder called assets, where we will keep the various assets that we're using. And I happen to have an image file, which I'm just going to drag into that assets folder. So there we go. That's our Fine Labs logo in the Assets folder. At this point, I'm going to use a Fine Helper command line app. It's going to be very useful for packaging and other things, but it has a function called bundle, which is going to help bring the asset into our binary. If you've not used the Fine command line tool before, you just would call it Fine like that. If it's not installed, you'll need to get it now. You can do that with the Go tools. You could just say go install find.io slash find slash v2, again, to make sure that you get the latest uh, API version. And the tool is currently in cmd find. And at latest, we'll then ask it to download the version that matches our API. Uh, so executing that command, we'll download it, install it into your uh, go binaries location or go path depending on your environment setup. If it doesn't seem to be discovered by your terminal, then you can go back to the developer site that I showed you before. There's a troubleshooting page right at the end of the main menu and that talks about various ways that it might not be discovered. Essentially, it's an environment variable issue. The Go installer should get it right, but sometimes it doesn't. So go have a look there if it's not working for you. Anyhow, so Fine um, has a, a few package helpers, package release. It can help you get your application ready for stores. But the one that we're going to look here is Bundle. The documentation hints that it's embedding, um, and embed package is available, but it's pretty straightforward to use. We could execute that on the command line, but it's just a little bit more helpful to use Go Generate, which is a tool that means that you can embed commands into your source code so that people can execute them easily without having to know the details and you don't have to remember what you typed. So we do that by putting a small comment that starts go uh, generate into our, any one of our files actually, but the theme feels like the right place to put this. And we're going to execute fine bundle no clues for guessing that one. Um, we're going to tell it the file that we want to output, the go source file. Um, I'll just call it bundled.go. And what do we want to bundle? Well, the assets directory, essentially. Well, all the files, it's only one file. But any files in there will get bundled. So that's the command. You could copy this out and paste it directly into the command line. But because we've now put it in our source code, I could just type go generate. And that's going to run the function, uh, the command, sorry, that's embedded in the comment there. As you can see, it created bundled.go. And this is an auto-generated file, you can see, that has created some really helpful variables. This resource logo, excuse me, this logo PNG is a resource representing the bytes of that logo that I dragged in. A static resource implements the resource imp interface for fine. Now, that might sound like a lot of words, of course, but what that means is our logo can now be embedded into the user interface just by using the variable name and passing it to the new image from resource. Then we need to return that container that we have created and then use it. So here, instead of toolbar, we can say make banner. Now, with any luck, that is going to create
create a slightly more sophisticated UI. Oh, wow, almost, but you can see the image has stretched. All widgets fill the space available by default, but in this case, that's not quite what we were looking for. So the scale mode for the image isn't quite right. So we can specify that. Um, in fact, it's not the scale mode, it's the fill mode, isn't it? Scale would be how the pixels are taken from the image to the screen. Fill is how it decides what amount of space to make use of. So for the different fill modes, I'm going to pick contain. And we can look at the documentation for that, but it's going to make sure that it fits in the space, maintaining the aspect ratio. So because the height is the constraint, it's going to bring the width in so that it maintains the appropriate look. And there you go. It's fitting in the space and it is centered right above content. That was a good check that we're doing the right things. Cool. Okay, so we've embedded an image. We've got the layout right. Um, we've got a basic toolbar here. It's not doing anything, but it's functional. Um, let's put some more uh, visibility around the content. So if you remember the um, image that we were working from, the content, obviously it wasn't a label, um, but it was a different colored piece of content that then multiple different items were put into. We're not going to actually fill the content right now. That's a couple of videos down the road, but what we can do is to put a rectangle in here that's a slightly different color to show what's going on. New rectangle, and we pass that a color, um, uh, a new, well, it doesn't need to be RGBA, new gray. Um, let's just use the gray there. That takes a single color channel, um, I think almost white. Um, so that'd be EE, for example. Um, and we no longer have an alignment property. It's not text, it's just a rectangle. And that will just help to show the what the layout was indicating before. There's now no specific size, so we can address that. But we have our content right there in the middle and the left and the right. So what that's indicated, I think really, is that the layout's not, not quite right. And of course, it turned up tiny. We'll address both of those things. That's clearly smaller than the user interface should ever be. And these panels should be larger. If the content we put in there was larger, that would be fine. But I think it's gonna be important that they match on the size. And the things that we drop into them as the interface develops are going to vary in size. So it'd be good to have a layout that consistently sets these up to be consistent, consistent, consistent. <laughs> Sorry. So let's look at a custom layout as the last major component that we add to this application today. So I think once again, it might be helpful to have a new file, layout.co in the main package, we will need a type. I'll just call it Fission Layout because it is the main layout for this application. In this case, we're not overriding anything. There's no kind of built-in layout that we want to enhance. I mean, we could, I suppose, have taken the border and extended it in, in some way, but this is pretty straightforward math, so I'm not going to worry about that too much. We'll create a, a constructor function, new vision layout. And this, much like the border layout, we should pass in the things that we want it to be positioning on the screen. So I'll mimic it top left, right, because there's no bottom in our UI and content. And that is going to return um, a layout. Yep, cool. Ah, these are all canvas objects. 
Oops. And so we will need to do the work of a layout in our type, uh, which I'll return here. Um, but we're going to want to remember what this top left, right um, and content were. So uh, let's just um, let's just do that top. these fields don't match to anything because our struct has uh, nothing in there. So top, left, right, content. And not canvas object. That should uh, set up the parameters that we're passing in. Um, but we don't implement the layout yet. So I'm going to look at what a layout exactly is by, well, you could read that or by command tapping and going to the details. So yeah, we're going to implement this layout interface. It takes two methods, nothing too complicated. The layout call and the min size call because the layout is used to lay out a container. So the main thing is of course, putting things in the right place for a list of canvas objects and the size available. How do we put everything in its place? But also, as you saw, the window could collapse down and we knew it shouldn't be that small. So we can specify the min size that the container for these objects should be taking up. So let's just copy those two calls out. And that's what we will implement. So just like we did with the theme, we will add functions for this layout. layout. There. Ooh. that to there. Uh, I don't think we need documentation that replicates the documentation of the interface we're implementing. And again, we copied this items out of the fine package. So we just put the namespace on those items there. So we have our type passed in parameters. It's our responsibility for laying these items out. And for understanding the min size, that should be taken. Oh, right, okay. Well, where, where do we begin? Well, let's think. So we have the top content, which will fill the space, and the two sides. Okay, so the sides, we're going to be equal size to match. Um, that's straightforward. The top bar, it has a size already. So I suppose we could cheat. Um, get started with top height. That's easy because we have an item called top. Oh, I forgot the uh, actual variable name there. Um, L dot top has a min size, which has a height. So that's how much space is, is used for the top. Um, side width is probably the next one. Let's go with yeah a number where do we figure out what number would be useful well we have some some information that we can work with before we finish this coding i suppose we should fix compilers let's just say the min size is 10 for now and objects are passed into min size and into layout, but this size, this is intriguing. So because we're laying out the content of the app, we can understand what size is used and make some intelligent decisions about what that would mean. The reason this is a little complicated is because a size in fine refers to a pixel independent size. Screens vary so much in the pixel um, size that they're using, the number of pixels on screen, and of course, the different types of devices are going to have an impact. So we don't count pixels. We never do. This is a, a vector based toolkit, but it can make it difficult to understand exactly what size is correct. We could look at the source code of other things, but actually it could be quite useful just to see what size looks like on screen. So we can log 
what size has been asked of our layout. And to make use of that, oh, we can see it's not being used. Let's wire that into our user interface and then we can understand it a little bit better. So our user interface, instead of a new border, is going to use our layout. Okay, so how do we wire a custom layout in? Well, it's actually fairly straightforward. Um, we do container.new, but we don't specify. Oh, wow. That was an educated guess, given that I couldn't spell the package. We can pass it a new layout instead of using one of the built-in ones. Our layout took the top, um, which was the banner, um, the left and right, and content. Excellent. So we've replaced the border layout. But we are only passing in the layout part there. If you look at the container.new, it takes a layout and a list of objects. We haven't passed in the objects, they would be parameter two. So the only little gotcha here is we actually need to um, make a list of the objects that it's going to be managing. So a canvas object slice, which is in the order they'll be drawn. Um, the content being kind of the main thing should go to the back so that our other areas um, surround it. So that is um, content and then we have top left and right yeah but of course we don't have top to find it's this banner here so we actually do need to extract that to a variable here like we had before so that we can reference it twice it's important that it's exactly the same object instance in the object list as passed into the layout um, so we well, that should really be plural, I suppose. We pass that in. It doesn't take a slice. It takes a, a variable argument. So we just do dot, dot, dot. And that's the complete code. Now, if we run that, it's probably going to not look right because we haven't really implemented the layout at all. But it does give us numbers. As you can see, it started at size 10, 10. Pretty small, not very useful. But that's because we said the minimum size is 10, 10. So it's actually doing its job. If we grow this, these items are not in the right place. They're at zero, zero, just at the top left. They have zero size, so they're doing some weird things. None of them are big enough for their minimum size. But if I drag this out to something, oh, excuse me, to something about that size, we can look here. It's, oh, there you go. It's like 1100 by 750 or something like that. So, um, I guess knowing just a little bit about the size of um, screens and user interfaces and something, that sounds like 1024 by 680, close enough. And on the side, in if we've got a thousand or so, let's take a, just over a fifth on each side. That was a lot of just sort of thought, random, but let's code something up a little bit. Now this magic number for how big the size should be, that's a constant, at least for the minute. So let's just call that um, side width, um, call it 220 for now. We don't need to be logging the size anymore, but we did learn that it would be good to have the window larger. Oh, let's come back to that actually a little bit later. Let's see how the min size pans out first. So we were, oh yes, we were in the middle of doing the layout. So we've got the top height and now we've got the side width. And I think with those bits of information, we can do the layout of all of our components. Now, a generic layout is told the items that it's going to lay out. If it was a grid or um, something else where everything was uniform, we could just iterate through the slice and apply the right algorithm but as you see we've passed the items in so we know them we know them by name which is important so that we can move each one to its specific location so top is going to be resized um, ah, l dot top 
um, and that's going to be to the width is the full width, so size dot width. So it stretches right the way across, and the height is top height. We don't actually need to move it because it is at the top left, and the default position for everything is zero zero, the top left of the user interface. The left item, so L dot left, is slightly positioned down. So we need to move that to a new position. And it goes down, but not in. So the X is still, is still zero, but the Y is down from the top by top height. Straightforward. And the um, resize is kind of the opposite of the top bar, I suppose. The width is side width, but the height is size dot height minus the top height. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Then our right, well, that must be pretty sim similar. Um, it's not going to be zero on the X, though. That's going to be size dot width minus side width. It's still down by the top height, and it's resized in the same way, yeah, because we want left and right to be the same size. And lastly, we have the content. Um, so that's going to be in from the top left and reduced by two amounts of the size. So content move is x is side width, and down is, is top height. Yep. Resize will be there. So the width is O size dot width. Um, there it is, sorry. Minus side width times two. And the, ah, sorry, I realized now it was not helpful because it was not inside the size constructor. And the height is size dot height minus top height. Okay, well that looks plausible. Oh. Of course we could write some unit tests for this and we'll get that into that later, but this is really just get the project set up and running. So let's let's just run it and have a look. The size is the min size still. We'll come back to that, but if we drag this out. Oh, there you go, look at that. If you make it wide enough, it does in fact, yeah, we've got the left and right and the content in the middle and the, and the toolbar at the top. Wow, that's pretty cool. Toolbar, the image in the toolbar, that's touching the content. I don't like that. While we're looking at this, just go back to the user interface. And our logo, I don't really want that to touch the edges. The toolbar can go can go up against it, I suppose. Or would it? Yeah, well for now, let's just embed the logo a little bit. So we can make it inset by a padding, um, just by saying container.new padded. Um, pass the logo in there. So that will just indent, indent it, I suppose. Yeah, by the standard padded amount specified by the theme. That's looking okay. Uh, the layout was correct. The min size was no good. Um, so we need to actually figure out what the min size is. Well, let's just see if we could do the math in line. Um, we want the width. So the width is two times the side. Oh, goodness me side width times two, that's not including the content, okay? And the height is top height. Um, well, that's a really helpful suggestion. The height of the min size of the top. Oh, that's exactly what we had above, isn't it? Isn't it smart? Oh, so that was nice. But that would leave the window at the size with no content visible. We could do a little bit of inline maths, but um, we'll call this the borders size. What we really want is to make it a bit bigger. So to, to make that clearer, we could do a little bit of maths on that size, and we could just say add width height to create space for the content in the middle. So we could say, I don't know, 100 by 100. That's pretty straightforward. So we figured out what the border size is, and we added space for the content. So now, the layout hasn't changed, but the window is bigger. 
And as you can see, it's quite correctly figured out. We need space for the content, but other than that, use things at the minimum size. Our logo is slightly indented, so it's not touching the edges, and our left and right are the right size. And that could be truly the minimum size for our content. You can see the window won't go any smaller now, but it's not really the size that we want the window to be. Now we don't play with min size to change that because truly that is what we think the minimum size is, but we can request the window to be larger. So it's stepping out from the layout code, we can go back to our main file, which doesn't have much in, and we can add another line of code. So we can ask the window to resize a little bit like a component inside a layout. This is really just requesting a resize from the operating system. The window might not suit or, or be capable of what we're about to ask it. But let's just say that 1024 by um, 768 that we thought of earlier. These numbers, although it refers to a window, still aren't pixel sizes because all of the sizes in fine relate to the same coordinate system, which is going to work identically across different platforms. So you can, once you understand it, forget about the details. And if we run that one more time, there we go. There is a window that is a pretty good size for the content that we want to put in it. And I think that's, that's a grand amount of work. It could still do with a little definition. If I remember rightly, there were bars, little separators between left, right and content and under the toolbar. Okay, well, let's just see if we can do that before we wrap up. So in our user interface, we have used the layout to specify the objects that are going to be positioned in our screen. Um, but really we want to add three separators. Um, I just call it dividers, it's easier to spell. Um, so that's three. And I can just do new separator um, three times, I suppose. So that's three separators in a list of dividers. We can tell our layout that these are the dividers as well. Let's just pass that at the end. Um, our objects, however, is going to need to include that as well. So let's just move that down. And for simplicity, let's assume that the, the separators are on top. Um, we can just pass these one at a time. We could iterate over it. I mean, it's probably technically less efficient to do so, a little bit cleaner, but this is pretty simple. We're just passing those three objects into the list of objects that will be displayed. And all we need to do is update our layout to understand where they should go. So first of all, we're passing in three canvas objects for our separators. Um, call them divs, I suppose. Or oh, that is probably confusing. <laughs> it's not HTML here. Um, so we'll put them there and there, which means we need to pass them through. Because it's in the object list that's being laid out, we could really have indexed them from here instead, but it feels a little bit less clean. So after we've positioned all of our content, let's just do the same thing for the dividers. So our divider zero, let's call that the one along the top, will move um, to the zero and top, oh, it's just over the left-hand panel, isn't it? So it's the same. Um, we could avoid creating multiple positions by reusing the actual fine position object, um, but I'm not going to get too much into optimization or refactoring at this stage of our video series. Um, and we'll need to resize it as well. The size, well, it's going to be um, really thin uh, height wise, but width is full width. So size dot width. And the height actually is specified again in our theme 
there is a separator of thickness. Um, separator thickness size, which we can use here. In fact, instead of calling that a lot, let's just do that. Um, we'll use that at least three times. Um, so for now, then we have the second one, index one on the left. So dividers one, we're going to move that to where the content is, I suppose. Yeah. Now, technically, this is going to create a little overlap, but let's just reuse the maths for now. Um, one. And this is going to be um, divider thickness width. And the height is size dot height minus top height. Um, and kind of like before, we can basically copy this for divider two. The resize is the same. The move, instead of side width, it is size dot width minus side width. I think that is probably correct. They're not going to impact our minimum size, at least not significantly, so we can ignore them. And there we go. It's kind of subtle, but at the same time, it's nice. We've got our crisp line under the toolbar, and there is a bit of a more substantial transition between the left and the content and the content and the right. And as we move the user interface around, the resize is affecting the layout it's calling it again, it's putting everything into the right place. Well, there we go. I hope that's been really helpful. Um, that's that's it for this applic for this video. Um, we've pulled together the basics, we started our project, we have set up a few widgets into a window, we had a custom theme and a custom layout. So I feel like we've covered quite a lot here. Do come back for our next video. We're going to be talking about um, initial file handling, how you interact with the file system, how we can open a folder, um, and we'll add some more widgets to the UI to show that we've got files loaded. Um, if you want to know more about what we have been discussing, then you can head to our website. So as you might have guessed from the name of the application, um, the app is called fission.app. The URL to it is fission.app. Feel free to drop there and see what is latest. This website will probably be updated before you see. Um, and if not, if you would like to know more, tap on Collaborative App Builder, which is kind of this idea behind what we're building. That screenshot should look familiar. And if you want to be kept up to date, do fill in your email address there to get early access to what we're building. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the next episode. I hope this has been helpful and I really look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thanks so much and have a great day. Bye.